speaking forcefully, let's say, or perhaps even somewhat angrily by the end was because not only was the free, the white noise generator. My name is David Lindauschu. I'm unwell. I need help. I need help. I just wanted to meet you. I'm unwell. I call my I hope that you up there. I want to be well there. find the help that you need. I want to know him better. exams from professors like Gary Habermas here um, to face, and we, uh, we just have to remember that, David. You know, we're older, we're set in, set in life, and these guys are just coming up, and, and, yeah. um, and, and so you guys will all be in our prayers, too. Let me, let me tell you something. I think what you just saw is where a lot of you are, but David's just honest enough to cry for help. And some of you are at, are, are at a place, and this is, I think, why your book has connected with people. You're at a place where you're just looking for answers. No one ever taught you basic principles of life, basic survival skills. No one ever told you to make your bed or to show up and, and, and listen and learn. And, and then the dam breaks. And in those moments, I'd rather you be here in this context and in this community, because I can tell you from our community group leaders to our RAs to our RSs and to every student here that we think God has you here for more than just an education, but for community. And hold on, don't clap, hold on. I, I don't want us to alleviate what God's saying in this moment. And I'll be the first to tell you in front of our distinguished guests that these rules work, but all of them stop short without the ruler, without Christ in your life. And, and, and we are here for that. We're here for you. I'm so glad that happened, <laughs> because I think it just elevates. David. Pardon me? It was a little hard on David. No, not at all. Um, why, do you think, why do you think men like that, and so many of us, are just crying out for help finally? Obviously, you just see this visible manifestation, like that's not conjured up, that's real. Why do you think that? M well, it's so obvious why people are in, like, for me as a clinical psychologist, I've always looked at things, I think, in some ways from the opposite perspective of most, and maybe even most psychologists. I, it's never been a mystery to me why people are depressed. Mm. It's never been a mystery to me why people are anxious and unsettled. It seems obvious why they're concerned and, and hurt and anxious and unsettled. I, I think the mystery is how it is that we can conduct ourselves so that that can remain under control. I mean, people deal with very heavy burdens in their life, you know. You, you don't have to talk to someone for very long. Someone you might, might be thinking is doing quite well in the world, and, and, and sometimes people are. But you don't have to scratch very deep beneath the surface before you find out that they have a family member who has a serious illness or someone who's suffering through a economic crisis of one form or another, or, or who, there's some source of genuine tragedy yeah. 
one degree removed from them, if it's even removed. And most people, even as individuals, have at least one serious problem that they're dealing with. And so it's no mystery that people find it difficult to orient themselves in the world. And the mystery is, well, what can you do about it? And we do know what you can do about it. And, and you know, Jonathan Haidt wrote a book recently um, uh, now, I'm afraid that it's, uh, the name of the book has escaped me. It's about the college situation and, and the snowflake culture. And um, one of the things that he pointed out, along with Luginov, who's his co-author, was that if you're a psychotherapist of any sort, particularly a behavior therapist, what you help people do is to identify their problems. That's the first thing, is to yeah. confront what's there, the, the reality of what's there, in, 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 as bluntly as possible. And so you often end up, as a psychotherapist, talking to people about their array of problems. As, it's as if they're putting their cards on the table. And, and you sort out their problems. It's like, and no, they often decide that many of the things that are bothering them are not really that important. They can wait, but that there are crucial life challenges that present themselves to them. And they're not just psychological problems, although sometimes they are. They're, they're problems in life, right? existential problems. And then what you do is you help people break them down into manageable units, let's say, strategically, and confront them voluntarily. You know, and, and there's an echo of that idea. There's an echo of that in, in, in Christian thinking, and the echo for that is to pick up your cross voluntarily, which is that you have an, you have a, a, an, an unavoidable mortal burden to bear in life. There's no escape from it except to directly confront it and to take it on voluntarily. And what's so fascinating about that, two things, one is that psychotherapists of every stripe understand that this is one of the primary reasons that psychotherapy works. There's no dispute about that among all the different psychotherapeutic schools, is that the confrontation of existential problems, voluntary confrontation, is curative. And that's really something. And so, and, 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 and the practical aspect of that is quite straightforward. It, 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 it also indicates, practical and philosophical, it also indicates to you that there's far more to you than you think, because it turns out that you have substantial problems, genuine, deep problems of malevolence and suffering, but that if you decide that you will take that on as your responsibility, that you can put yourself together psychologically, just the courage, and you can actually solve the problems. And, 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 and that seems to be true. It's, 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 it's not a naive wish. It, it seems to be well within our capacity. And I mean, that's part of the message, I would say, of 12 Rules for Life, is that dark as things are, there is more light in you than you know what to do with, and there's more light in you than you can possibly manifest. And, and, the, and the way to find that out is to, to challenge yourself against these massive problems and to find out that you're the one that can deal with them. So that's a great thing to know. And so maybe the context isn't the most preferred, but you just, you have someone who just initiates the conversation and crying out for help. And uh, you're, you know, this is what you do. You're a clinical psychologist. So on a very practical everyday language, you know, for those of us who just, what is a good first step? If someone is sitting here and they're saying, and I'm not going to jump on stage and cry for help, but I'm, I'm at a place where I'm thinking about ending my life. I, I'm in such a dark season of my life where I feel like the valley is the lotus it's ever been. What is a first step right now that you would say? Well, I, I would say, practical? look, I would say that if you're, if you're seriously suicidal, and you can tell if you are, if you have a plan, like a plan that you've, that you've, 
played out in fantasy multiple times, if you know how you would do it and when and where, and if you fantasize about the aftermath, like if that's a well-developed plan, then you should go talk to someone. You should talk to someone professional. You should let a friend know. You should let a family member know. Like, you need to do that. You're at risk. You're in danger under those circumstances. In, in less serious circumstances, I would say, people often ask me if I pray which is an annoying question as far as I'm concerned, but they still ask me that. And I, I've suggested a form of prayer, which I would say I do engage in, and that is to, practically speaking, to do something like sit on the edge of my bed or on the edge of a chair and to think, there's probably something that I'm doing wrong or not doing well enough, that I'm being blind to, that I could fix, and that I would fix. You know, you know, you need both of those, right? Because there's lots of things about your life that you know aren't right, that you could fix, but you won't. Who knows why? You don't have the discipline, or the vision, or the courage, or, 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 or the integrity of character, or the maturity, or God only knows the reasons. But there are some things that you're doing wrong or not doing that you could fix, that you would fix. And you have to sit and, and, and ask. And, and I think it's, it's, it's the reflection of the New Testament idea that if you knock, the door will open, you know, and if you ask, you will receive. It's a very interesting line because it, 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 it sounds like something that's naively optimistic. It sounds like it's representing God as you know, the grantor of wishes in some sense, but I don't believe that's what it means at all. I, th I think what it means is that if you actually want to know something, and you actually want to devote yourself to something, if you're willing to make the proper sacrifices, right, and reorient yourself, that you can move towards what you're aiming at. And I, I can tell you that if you ask yourself in all humility, how it is that you could be better and what you could do in a small way to move in that direction, that first of all, you will receive an answer about what you're doing wrong. It's not that much different than thinking. We don't regard that as particularly miraculous. Like you could ask yourself a question and come up with an answer. But if you ask yourself a question about how it is that you're lesser than you could be and what you could do about that, you'll find out. And then if you do that, then you won't be lesser. And that works. And it especially works. It, it, it's a nice form of humility as well, because what you're going to find out if you ask that question is it's not going to be something you're proud of. It's going to be some little rotten element of your character that you're ashamed of in 15 different ways, and, and for good reason. And, it's, it's, and even the attempt to triumph over it isn't going to be something that you're going to be able to trumpet proudly to your friends and your family, because, you know, to fight off something that's shameful is a private affair in some sense. But you can do it. And if you can improve your life incrementally in that manner, if you have the humility, one of the things Carl Jung, the famous psychoanalyst, said about modern people, which I loved, was that Modern people can't see God because they won't look low enough. And a lot of that lowness is internal. It's like, well, what's not good enough about me? And the other thing that's so lovely about that is you're not going to do anyone any harm. You know, if you find out something that you're lacking, if you discover something you're lacking, well, first of all, great, you've discovered something you're lacking, and you need that thing you're lacking, because life is difficult. It's going to call everything that there is out of you, and so you need that thing that you're lacking, and then you can work on it incrementally and, and humbly, you know, humbly meaning you can work on it in the way that someone as flawed as you could work on it successfully, and then, and then you, and then it works. And then things get better, and as they get better, they tend to get better and better. And so that's very practical and, and very much in keeping with psychotherapeutic practice and wisdom, and, and I would say with ancient wisdom in, ge in general. And so that's a, that's a lovely, that's a lovely set of, 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 
of things to know, in my opinion.